This season on The Catch, we focused our attention on Mexico's upper Gulf of California, a place Jacques Cousteau once described as the aquarium of the sea, and how nowadays the lives and livelihoods of its local fishers are under immense pressure. Over the past five episodes, we've talked about the vaquita porpoise, the smallest of its kind, whose habitat has become inundated with gill nets. These are used to catch the highly desirable blue shrimp, as well as the totuaba, a croaker species whose swim bladders are illegally sold in Asian markets. And it is the bladder from the large females that's particularly desirable, selling for tens of thousands of dollars per kilo up in Chinese retail markets. We've learned about the infiltration of Mexican cartels who've swooped in to profit from illegal fishing and the devastating impact they've had on the lives of local fishers. And if you don't cooperate as a fisherman, they'll burn your house down. We've also talked about the work of NGOs like Sea Shepherd, who've taken direct action in the upper Gulf, as well as the National Resources Defense Council, who successfully pushed for a U.S. embargo on seafood from the region. It became clear pretty soon after working on this for a while that we would have to turn up the pressure on Mexico through economic squeeze to really compel action. Finally, we've delved into the reaction of the Mexican government and how weak enforcement has allowed the status quo to persist. There are laws on the books in Mexico that would do a very good job protecting the vaquita, protecting the fishermen. Unfortunately, Mexico is not doing a good job implementing those regulations. It is definitely their fault. And all we can say is that the situation is messy. But it's not hopeless. I'm Ruxandra Guidi, and this is The Catch. Today, episode six, The Future. We look at the real gains that have been made for the vaquita, the fishers, and the future of the upper Gulf of California. Let's begin today back where it all started, in Puerto Peñasco, Sonora, where we're meeting up with fishers who are keeping their traditions alive and trying to do so in balance with nature. And like many of our days of field work, this one's starting out at sea. We meet our friend Ernesto Gastelum, the clam diver we met in the first episode. We're out in Espanga, scanning for industrial or trawling ships. They use nets that wipe out everything across the seabed. It's a very destructive practice, but these ships stay out of the vaquita habitat. The pangas we've seen in the Golfo de Santa Clara and in San Felipe usually can carry only two fishers, whereas these industrial ships hold a crew of up to 10. They'll be out on the water for up to 15 days, and on a very good day, they easily catch more than twice than what a panga can. We approach one of these industrial ships, and my colleague journalist Ernesto Mendez speaks to someone in the crew. The fisher tells us that they can catch up to 80 pounds of shrimp a day, but they haven't had much luck today. They're preparing to fish elsewhere, so we decide to try another ship. A few minutes later, we find the Tabuada. It's a white and blue ship. We can see its trawls on both sides and a strange thing called a turtle excluder device. It's a special piece of equipment required by the Mexican Environmental Agency that keeps sea turtles from getting caught in their nets. And I have to say, after being out in the water and barely seeing any presence from the Mexican government, it's nice to finally find evidence of policies that are actually being implemented. Of the seven species of sea turtles that exist around the world, six of them are in Mexico and all of them are endangered. We can only see one crew member on board the Tabuada who's on duty. His name is Jose Antonio Garcia. He must be about 60 or so years old. He tells us that the captain is asleep since they've been out at sea for days. Jose Antonio tells us that they still have a few more days of fishing left, and then they'll be able to return home with their earnings. The crew will take a few days off, and then they'll go out again. It's not an easy life, Jose Antonio says. 
and his children know it. None of them followed in his footsteps. He tells us that one of his sons is a musician who plays for tourists in bars and hotels across Puerto Peñasco. Another son tried fishing for a while, but then decided to become a painter. What Jose Antonio is telling us is something we've heard already elsewhere. Fishing is hard. Sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. And besides, it's very difficult to compete with the illegal fishers because the government doesn't monitor or support the legal ones. What's more, organized crime continues to infiltrate and intimidate many of these communities. Something has to change for fishers here, and it's happening, albeit slowly. We say goodbye to Jose Antonio and chat with Ernesto Gastelum aboard his banga. He tells us he was encouraged to see the turtle excluder device on the Tabuada ship. And he says he too wants to set an example for others on how to be a more eco-friendly fisher. He has strived to create a sustainable market for his catch, the white clam. Las que son de tamaño mediano, intermedio, son las que tienen más carne. Las más grandes son super reproductoras, o sea, están reproduciendo constantemente. Ernesto Gastelum tells us how he keeps an eye out for the smaller clams, the ones that have yet to grow to adults, and he doesn't harvest those. He's careful not to overharvest in the same spots. And even though he doesn't have the actual paperwork, he follows all the standards of a fishery that has a sustainable certification like MSC. Gastelum is referring to the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC, a sustainable fishing certification. Obviously, a fisher like Gastelum would be able to earn much more selling to an international market, but his profit would be even greater if he could ensure that his catch has minimal impacts on the ecosystem. Megan Westmeyer of the NGO Sustainable Fisheries Partnership tells us that more consumers of white clams or shrimp or any other seafood should demand to know where their food came from, but also be prepared to pay more for sustainable seafood. Those third-party labels can give consumers who care, can give them an assurance that somebody else has taken a look and has made sure it's a good product. But the consumer also needs to keep in mind that something like that third-party label, that MSC, Marine Stewardship Council logo, that costs a lot of money to get that third-party expert in there. So it can be very beneficial, yes, but it can also definitely increase the price of seafood. And where there is no flexibility in price, where a consumer is not willing to pay more, it can put a big financial burden on the fishermen. In other words, fishers need more support in order to truly be more sustainable. Back in Puerto Peñasco, Castellum takes us to one of the docks. Tourists don't come around here, and neither do artisanal fishers who work in pangas like Gastelums. Here you can only see those industrial ships we found out at sea. Several have just arrived with their catch from the night before, and they're a floating shrimp, but above all, hake, a kind of cod, one of the most popular fish in Mexico and around the world. This area, the wider Gulf of California, is one of the country's most productive fisheries, accounting for almost three quarters of Mexico's catch. We're watching as fishers take their product out in plastic storage boxes filled with ice. One by one, they're putting the boxes inside a freezer truck that will take them to a processing plant. And from there, cod or shrimp or whatever will be cleaned, packaged and prepared for sale. This all looks great, but what's missing here is a traceability law that could verify the origin of the catch and make sure it remains properly labeled as it moves through the various stages of production and distribution. With increasing demand for sustainable seafood, such traceability would allow importers and consumers to know whether their product has been legally caught. Obviously, this would also help conservation efforts But getting Mexico to move forward on this has been challenging, as we told you in episode five. An international body regulating trade in wildlife species known as CITES announced sanctions against Mexico in March for failing to eradicate illegal fishing and trade in Totuaba. 
those sanctions didn't end up going through. At the last minute, Mexico promised to get its act together, which was a relief to many local fishers. I asked Vanda Felba Brown, the expert on organized crime and species trafficking at the Brookings Institution, about the impact of this mounting international pressure and what's at stake. So large bans, large sanctions, have devastating economic uh, consequences for the country and have devastating uh, economic consequences for individuals and their families. I certainly can think of many people I interacted with who would be affected and my heart uh, goes out to them. And so it's important that uh, the industry and the fishers themselves start talking to the Mexican government and say, look, what will happen to us unless you take the actions that you are responsible for? You're supposed to set the regulation and enforce it. You're supposed to protect us against uh, criminal actors. But it's not only the fishers of the upper Gulf who must put pressure on the government and seek dialogue. There are many of us implicated in this complex web. Marine biologist and our travel partner, Alex Oliveira, would like to see U.S. consumers also raise their voices to spur change. Estados Unidos ya está ejerciendo presión en contra de México. Alex says there's currently a campaign to boycott the shrimp of the Upper Gulf. U.S. consumers should be informed of the harm caused by Upper Gulf shrimp and should demand to know where it comes from. There should be a certification that can guarantee that shrimp from the Upper Gulf is vaquita-free. Currently, so-called vaquita-friendly fishing methods are hardly in use. We learned about those in episode 5, when we met the folks at Pesca ABC, and they told us about alternative fishing practices. U.S. marine biologist Barbara Taylor would like to see more of those, too. If you want to save vaquitas, you need to develop sustainable alternative fishing gear. That advice, right from the very beginning, has been to actively give the fishermen in those towns that don't have many other ways of making a living, alternate ways to catch fish. And sadly, that is the piece of advice that has not been taken. And yet, when we were in San Felipe, southwest of Puerto Peñasco, we met up with a group of fishers who are bucking the trend. (laughs) They're all associated with Pesca ABC. They'd gone fishing that morning using alternative fishing methods, so not gill nets, but suriperas. These are nets that use a smaller trawling system that's driven by the wind or the sea current. Pesca ABC also uses other trapping methods, some of which they've developed, others that are inspired by sustainable fishing practices in other parts of the world, like Japan. That night, these fishers invited us to a sustainable feast. Sea bass and mackerel ceviches, two fish that are abundant in the upper Gulf. <laughs> That's Nadia Alcantar, a fisher who comes from a San Felipe family that's been fishing for several generations. She offered me a beer and right away started showing me pictures from her fishing trips. Nadia's showing me more pictures on her cell phone. I can see her decked out like all the other fishers out here, yellow overalls and rubber boots. She's aboard a panga, smiling next to a big fish she's just caught. (laughs) Listening to Nadia speak, it's clear to me that she's proud of her family and their fishing tradition. I asked Nadia if all the women in her family are into fishing. And she says, yes, everyone in my family, my mom too. And then I ask her, do you see a lot of other women out here fishing? She says, no, we are very few. And there are still very few women in this industry. According to data from Mexico's National Institute of Statistics and Geography, only 8% of Mexican fishers are women. Nadia tells me that a few years ago, she and her friend Catalina, who's also here, sued a fishers cooperative for discrimination, for refusing to let them join, and they won. In the face of so many pressures, 
fishing in the upper Gulf of California is going through a lot of change, a kind of rebirth. There's certainly more awareness. Both fishers and environmentalists are trying to find the balance, trying to do what's right for the Gulf of California and for themselves. So that's what's happening with the fishing communities of the upper Gulf of California. But what about the vaquita? We started out by telling you how scientists think there's only 10 of these porpoises as their habitat is endangered. But in recent years, things appear to be improving, at least according to the NGO Sea Shepherd that's working in coordination with the Mexican Navy. Francois Van Sol has been working for Sea Shepherd's Operation Miracle in the Upper Gulf for five years. Last year, we've seen a reduction of 79% in illegal fishing between 2021 and 2022. This year, we aim to a 100% reduction. Van Sol's referring to a decline in illegal fishing, not in the entire Vaquita refuge, but just in the 2,000 square kilometers that make up the zero tolerance area. Earlier this year, Sea Shepherd held a press conference to introduce its new vessel, the Seahorse, a ship that will be able to monitor the Vaquita zero tolerance area 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And here's where there's another bit of good news. Navy Rear Admiral Jose Carlos Tinoco Castrejón gave more details at the same press conference. The Mexican Navy installed 193 underwater blocks of concrete with steel rebar along 225 kilometers of the zero tolerance area. And this action prevents the use of gill nets by illegal fishing groups. So now the secret is out, I guess. Rick Bresca, the ecologist who's been studying the upper Gulf of California for more than 50 years, whom we met in the first episode, told me about these blocks, about this idea of encircling the zero tolerance area. Apparently, it had been a super secret plan, something conservationists had proposed for several years. The idea was to place concrete blocks on the seabed within the zero tolerance area. Each of these blocks would have steel hooks that would completely slice through the illegal fishing nets used to catch the totuaba, where the vaquitas also get trapped. You can imagine there would be a lot of opposition to that plan, including opposition from the cartels. So they wanted to get those things installed before it sort of leaked what they were going to do. And that, if it's not too late, uh, that idea should work mm -hmm. if they can get those nets out of the water. As Rick says, the idea of so-called block seeding should work. It's something that's already being used in parts of Gibraltar and Spain, where it has almost completely curbed illegal fishing. This could be the last big effort to save the vaquita. The truth is, scientists still know very little about this porpoise. We can't say exactly how many remain, but we do know that the species, despite its small numbers, is genetically viable. That is, it has enough genetic diversity necessary for its survival. It has always been a small population with very little genetic variation, which suggests that it's been <laughs> on, threatened with being on the verge of extinction its, in, its entire history but yet it survives. So that tells me it's a rigorous, viable species that even if it gets down to four individuals, if we get the nets out, it may still survive. And there's evidence that the vaquita may just make it. There's hope its population could actually rebound, says Barbara Taylor. We continued to monitor them and there were a couple of good surprises. One was we found out that they could calve every year because now we could recognize individuals because they had um, nicks and tears in their uh, dorsal fin. Um, and we found out that um, the females were having calves as fast as they could and they could have calves every year. The other thing is we've been saying there's about 10 for the last four years. And if you project that decline that we were witnessing earlier, the highest probability is that vaquitas would already be extinct. And so we think that these last survivors are not just random survivors. They are animals that uh, likely got those scars in their dorsal fins by being entangled in gill nets and are especially careful around gill nets. 
so there's some hope if the zero tolerance area is really protected. Barbara says it's not a permanent fix. But at least right now, it's an absolutely critical Band-Aid. That will work until gill nets are completely eradicated from the Gulf of California. So get rid of the gill nets. It's a no-brainer. It should be that simple. Thank you for listening to The Catch. This was our last episode of season two. If you haven't yet, feel free to go back and check out season one, where we looked into the supply chain of squid caught far off the coast of Peru. Our podcast is brought to you by the Readers of Foreign Policy, with additional assistance provided by the Walton Family Foundation. Our production team includes Rosie Julin, Rob Sachs, Maria Jimena Aragon, and Jimena Letgard. Special thanks to our team in Mexico, Alex Oliveira and Ernesto Mendez. If you like what you're listening to, consider leaving a review and subscribing on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts, or head over to foreignpolicy.com, where you can listen to our other podcasts and subscribe to our newsletter. I'm Ruxandra Guidi. Thank you for joining us 